Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, our next speaker is here. Uh, so uh, Patrick is going to talk to us now about uh, airway clearance therapies. Patrick. So first, I, I want to uh, thank the other speakers who just kept building up this presentation here. <laughs> so, uh, so we hope we won't disappoint. Um, so airway clearance therapy, you've heard over and over again, is, is terribly important in the management of our uh, bronchiectasis and how we deal with that. And what I'd like to do is cover three important points, and I'm going to be pretty practical as we go through this. Why we should do airway clearance therapies, how we should perform airway clearance therapies, and then what other therapies might augment um, clearance of the airway secretion. So let's focus on this first one, and that's the why. And you've heard earlier that there's a, not a ton of evidence uh, that uh, describe um, the benefits of airway clearance. And when we were doing the guidelines in cystic fibrosis, uh, one time I had to do a pro-con debate um, for the CF meeting and talk about our systematic reviews and so forth. And, and the criticism of guidelines is that we're so dependent upon large randomized controlled trials and then the, the typical joke that's shown is that there are no randomized controlled trials for uh, parachutes, which is true. But the key is that you just need to have enough evidence to know what actually works. You don't have to have a randomized controlled trial for everything. So the, the reasons that we do airway clearance therapies is to get stuff out of the airways. So in those patients who have excessive sputum production or retain secretions that won't come out of the airways, if they have an ineffective cough, um, maybe they, because of that retained secretions, it's caused plugging and that air can't get into that space below it, or there's a foreign body. Those are all reasons why one might want to do some kind of augmented airway clearance. And there are a number of disease conditions in which airway clearance therapies is known to work. Cystic fibrosis is, is clear, bronchiectasis, asthmatics, other COPD patients, those who have chronic bronchitis, but also patients who have neuromuscular disease or are on ventilators, because now we've taken away their ability to cough and yet add to their increased secretions. So I'm going to talk just briefly about cystic fibrosis to just establish the context of why we need to do augmented airway clearance. And the pathogenesis of CF lung disease starts with a gene mutation, which codes for a very important protein. And because of that mutation, that protein is either deficient or it doesn't function well, and it causes a reduction in the airway surface liquid. Why is that important? Because these epithelial cells have cilia sitting on top of them, and they exist within that airway surface liquid. And they need that fluid to keep those cilia upright. And so if you zoom in on the airways, you realize that they are, in fact, rather hairy. These cilia are there, and they are functioning to move things out of the airway. So you see here these cilia are standing upright in that airway surface liquid, and they work together, beating rhythmically, to move that mucus layer up and out of the airways, just like an escalator. Now, when it works well... Like you can see here, these cilia are all standing upright, and they're working together and effectively move, moving that mucus across that membrane. I personally have watched Bruce Springsteen get passed around an entire arena <laughs> all the way back to the stage. Now, when the cilia are not working or they're not present, you get ineffective mucus clearance, and that secretion will sit there for a long period of time. And that's the key, is this is about impaired mucociliary clearance. Now we'll see if this works. Here's an example in which on the left side you see cilia which are working together rhythmically, and on the right, this is a patient with ciliary dyskinesia, those cilia look pretty lazy. They're not doing much at all. And on this example on the right, they're moving, but they're completely discoordinated. They are not working like you see on the left-hand panel. And that is the common link that we think about in patients who have bronchiectasis. And you've heard about the vicious cycle, where things start. 
And in this case, I'm starting with ciliary dysfunction, but there are other abnormalities that can be happening there with mucus hypersecretion. This actually leads to the incitement of inflammation. And we have, even in our CF patients, evidence of inflammation before we have evidence of infection. Now, I can't tell you for certain that it's not infection first. I'm just telling you inflammation occurs early in the process, but it creates an environment which is ripe for infection. And we are introducing bacteria into our airways by aspirating, and they're able to set up shop and be successful. And it's that combination of injury from the inflammation and the infection which is causing destruction of the airways and the development of bronchiectasis, and that just creates a bigger problem with the ciliary dysfunction. Now, in here, we've looked at it as a vicious cycle, and when Ken, Olivier, and Jim Chalmers and I were talking about this, we thought, well, these things actually affect every step along the way, so it really is more of a vicious vortex, that it creates this environment which is its process that is progressive. So the material that is contained in that airway that is retained, that, that phlegm, is actually rather thick and tenacious, and it contains lots of bad stuff. It's got lots of bacteria. I was at the FDA last week and talking about every drop of sputum in a CF patient contains millions of bacteria, and it has a lot of inflammatory mediators. So if they can cough up a quarter cup of this stuff, they unload a tremendous amount of infection and inflammation. And so you can see in this image here, this is sputum from a CF patient that's defying gravity, that it won't descend down. When we tackle the guidelines for cystic fibrosis related to airway clearance, I'm not going to go through all the data. Yes, there are not a lot of comparative trials. One of the reasons is that the, getting approval for a device is not as difficult as getting approval for a medication. You don't have to do large comparative trials to get an, a device approved. What you have to do is demonstrate that it works in the way you think it should and it's safe. And generally you can do that. So there's not a bunch of comparative studies. But when we crafted these guidelines, we were very, very careful because we knew what was going to happen as a result of them. Number one, airway clearance therapy is recommended for everybody. It is the most fundamental aspect of what we do for our patients. Number two, in general, there is no method of airway clearance which is clearly superior to another. That comes because we don't have a trial that says the vest is better than PEP or any other therapy is clearly better than another one. And we knew what was going to happen, that the, the insurance companies would say, oh, then that means everyone can do percussion postural drainage. They don't need any devices, which is not true. Because number three is that you need to find out what works best for the individual. And what is clear is what works best for one person might not be the same as for another person. Or what works best today might not be the best method that would work for you tomorrow. And then we added on the benefit of exercise. Exercise is good for a lot of reasons, including airway clearance. Now for bronchiectasis, non-CF bronchiectasis, there was a Cochrane review done, published years ago, that, that basically sort of focused on the lack of evidence and said, it looks like it's safe. Yeah, okay, that's true. Um, and we don't know what it does in acute exacerbations. Well, we kind of do. Uh, and more data are needed, which is the c standard conclusion of most papers. But more recently, we have the British Thoracic Society guidelines, which is actually looking at some of the evidence that talks about its ability to produce better expectoration of the sputum, to improve cough-related health status, to improve quality of life and the exercise capacity. And they, too, stated it should be taught to everybody. So how do we perform airway clearance therapies? And this is where I really want to focus on it because uh, uh, for the most part, when I have patients who have been referred to me, they've either never heard of airway clearance or they were given a vest or they were given a device, but they never got proper instruction. And so I asked them to show me how they do it. And I have yet to see anyone do it well. So I want to talk about just what we do. And these are the choices that you have. As was stated earlier, we have a lot of options. In the left column, you've got your standard percussion postural drainage, but the rest are all breathing techniques, and that's the one place where people don't do a lot of education, and I recommend having a respiratory therapist at part of your program to try and teach people about these breathing techniques. 
And on the right, we have all the devices and exercise. So let's start with percussion and postural drainage. The postural drainage part is easy. This is about gravity, right? You're just trying to point down what you want to try to empty out. And percussion, you see percussion being done here in a adolescent as well as an infant. Um, but I want to talk about this because this is what is typically taught, that it's like knocking ketchup out of a bottle. Now, the first part is I would not recommend buying this ketchup, okay? <laughs> ketchup should not do this. I don't know what kind of ketchup that was, but it ne I've never seen a ketchup fly out like that. But no, this is actually dead wrong. This is not how it works. You do not smack them with a flat hand. You need to hit them with a cupped hand. And the reason that you hit them with a cupped hand is because it is creating a little bit of compression, a compression wave into the lung. So you'll get compression of the lung, and then you'll get relaxation of the lung. And when you have that, you get volume changes. And when there are volume changes, there are tiny changes of airflow in those airways. So even though it's not big like I'm drawing it here, it's, it's tiny little airflow changes, and that is what you're doing. Plus, you're adding energy into the system, vibrational energy, and that's the way that it works. But percussion and postural drainage is tough. How many in this room have ever done percussion and postural drainage? Okay, the first thing, for those who've never done it, go get some bongos and beat some bongos for 15 minutes. And I'll bet you can't make it for 15 minutes. It is fatiguing. It takes time, it's, it's difficult, it requires a second caregiver. And so maybe it's a little bit easier when, well, so when your child starts trying to run away from you. But when, the, when your adolescent wants to go off to college or you want to be independent, who's going to do your therapy for you? Um, and then the other thing I want to say about, we talk positional changes, but we really don't like putting people all the way down. And because of reflux is the big issue, but there also can be some problems uh, related to the head. Now, just a little brief physiology about the airways. This is a spirogram. This is a flow volume loop. This is the maneuvers. Many of you in this room, perhaps most of you, all of you, have done a spirogram and what we look at. And what you see here on this curve is at the far left and going up, that's when the far left is when you're at your total lung capacity. Your lungs are as full as they're going to be. And when the lungs are filled with air, they pull the airways open. The resistance is the lowest it's going to be. So when you start to force it out, the air comes out very fast. But as the lung gets smaller, those airways become more narrow, so the airflow slows down. So that's why the airflow goes up, and then it begins to come down, and that dashed line is what normal looks like. But people who have obstructive airways disease, the, air, the airways are closing more rapidly, and that's why you get that sort of scooped look. The airways are clamping down. Now, why this happens, we can talk about Bernoulli. So Bernoulli's principle is that as the speed of a fluid goes up, the pressure goes down. That's important when you want to get on an airplane because that's how we get airplanes up in the air. The airflow across the wing, top and bottom, are different and you get different pressure changes. But in the airways, if the airflow is coming out fast in the airways, that is a lower pressure inside that airway. And if you already have a collapsible airway, that airway can collapse dynamically, even close completely too soon, trapping that air in there. So one strategy of dealing with that is slow the flow coming out. And we do that with purslip breathing. Ever ask a person who has bad emphysema why they're doing purslip breathing, they will tell you, I'm trying to apply some expiratory retard so I can slow the flow in my airways and keep them open longer. <laughs> they don't know why they do it, they just do it. But the reason they do it is because it does slow the flow, the airways stay open longer, they can get more air out. And that's what we try to do with PEP therapy, or positive expiratory pressure. And there are a number of devices that are sold in the market. Here's a couple. I have no connections with any of these companies that can be used to try and help people gauge that flow retardation to try to slow the air coming out. But there are a lot of these devices on the market. And what I often tell our parents of our young CF kids is that there's a, a great um, device company. It's called Toys R Us. And you can find all kinds of fun PEP devices present that will work quite well. 
Um, I dug this out a long time. This is my son 25 years ago. I don't remember what the event was, but he had his ribbon on. So that's PEP therapy. And then came oscillating PEP therapy. And the first one of these devices was the flutter. The concept is, is we still going to focus on PEP therapy to slide, slow the flow coming out, but we're going to try to oscillate that and create a different method of trying to create shear force to get those secretions out. And so in the flutter, what this is, is inside there's a spherical cone in which rests a steel ball. So when you blow on it, initially no air can get past it. So the pressure will build, it'll build enough to lift the ball, and when it does, now air can sneak around it which makes the pressure fall and the ball will fall. And so it will oscillate. And, it, and has everyone done the flutter valve? So it'll oscillate. Now, it was good. The problem with this is that it, you can't lie down because the ball will roll out of position and so forth. But you could tune it. And so here's my son practicing the flutter valve. And you can see the little Dizzy Gillespie cheeks that, that should happen because of that back pressure that's occurring there. And we now have other devices to try to deal with the, the faults of the flutter valve using magnets instead of um, the weight of a ball. And so you have um, other potential items for oscillating PEP. Now the nice thing about oscillating PEP devices is they're portable. You can put them in your purse, you can put them in your pocket, you can take them with you uh, when you travel. Then there was the VEST development, and this was developed actually out of a, a, a CF Doc's um, imagination to basically, if I could do chest PT across the whole chest all at once. And so the concept here is you have a compressor and it inflates these ballasts around the chest and then it oscillates air in and out and so the chest is being compressed. And when you compress and then relax, there's airflow and the secretions will come out and it creates independence. And so there are a number of devices that are out now um, you can see that the devices have gotten much smaller, you can get fancy colors, you can get other designs, and then some are actually rather portable. You can walk around your office, if you like, doing chest PT. The opposite of this is what we call IPV, or intrapulmonary percussive ventilation. So whereas the vest is compressing the lungs and then allowing relaxation, this is now blowing air into the lungs to inflate them and then letting the air come out in an oscillatory manner. IPV, uh, we don't use it much in the outpatient setting because it doesn't have the same support systems that we might need if things don't work so well, so we use it more frequently in the hospital. Uh, the challenge is here is not so keen on this in people who might be at risk for pneumothorax. So those are the other devices. I'm not talking about exercise, but exercise we recommend um, as well. So what other therapies might augment clearance of airway secretions? And I list up here just three categories. Bronchodilators, which I'm not going to talk about. There are purported benefits in terms of ciliary function or bronchodilation, but there are absolutely no data to demonstrate that they do what we hope they do. I had another pro-con debate at the European CF meeting where I was to defend the routine use of bronchodilators in CF patients. I was soundly defeated. And then I finished with, well, then you guys have to explain why 98% of your patients are on bronchodilators, because that sounds pretty routine to me. Mucolytics, uh, Dornase Alpha or Pulmazyme is an enzyme that we use to treat our CF patients. And you can see here that gravity-defying sputum, and then put an enzyme on it to digest it, it becomes more flow flowable and can come out. And it, the drug was approved in CF patients because it improved lung function, as you can see in the tracing there. It has become a standard therapy. Now, in those days, it, it was thought, it works in CF, it's got to work in other patients who have bronchiectasis. And so there were studies done. Uh, this is taking data from Ann's study, looking at a trial of pulmosyme in patients with idiopathic bronchiectasis. It was a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. They were trying to get sputum producers. And the goal was to look at changes in exacerbations. The first thing I want to point out is it made no difference in the lung function. That actually is not atypical. We don't really expect to see lung function change in many of these patients like we see in the cystic fibrosis patients. But of greater concern was it didn't, not only did it not make a difference in terms of reducing exacerbations, but the anomaly was in favor of causing more exacerbations. And so this is partly why it hasn't become standard practice standard use in bronchiectasis patients. However, 
in line with what was talked about earlier with phenotypes, there are patients that don't have cystic fibrosis but have many features very much like them and actually will benefit from the use of Palmazon. Hypertonic saline has become a standard therapy in our patients. Um, this are data from cystic fibrosis patients looking at the impact of hypertonic saline on mucociliary clearance. The intent here is to replace some of the salt in the water to get those cilia working and using uh, increasing concentrations. And the um, theatrical story is that it was in Australia that it was figured out that these surfers did better and that's why we thought of hypertonic sailing. Well, that makes for a good story. It's absolutely not true. Um, and if they did better, it's because they were out there huffing and puffing, working and doing stuff. Um, but some of this work actually was done by an Australian while he was at UNC and looking at increasing concentrations of salt and basically like any other dose finding, trying to find out where would the patient cry uncle and where would you get the greatest effect and 7% just happened to be coincidental that it was the same concentration as the ocean. So it had become standard practice in the CF patients um, in the last decade since the trial came out, uh, the use of, CF, of hypertonic saline has gone up dramatically. We use the same in bronchiectasis, and I tell every single patient when we put them on hypertonic, I say some people think it's the best thing that ever happened to them. Absolutely the best. They feel great, they can't believe it. Some people think we're Satan because it makes them cough, that's okay, but if it makes them cough all day long, that's not okay. Um, one of the downsides of hypertonic saline is it doesn't last very long, the, the salt gets absorbed very quickly, so then it was thought that a different osmotic agent could be used, so this is using mannitol, this is what makes your chewing gum sweeter, this is a, a sugar uh, alcohol, and it functions as an osmotic agent, you put it in a powder form and you could breathe it in, you can see a similar effect on clearance of secretions. And so uh, actually the FDA, the meeting last week was to discuss whether or not they should approve inhaled mannitol for the treatment of cystic fibrosis patients. So that's a lot. We're gonna try to get, I think we're back on time. I'm just gonna conclude. I cannot say it strongly enough. I said this 10 times to the FDA last week. Airway clearance is the most fundamental aspect of the treatment of bronchiectasis. Not of CF, of bronchiectasis, even in those patients with cystic fibrosis. The airway clearance therapy of choice should be tailored to the individual patient, which is the most effective. Our practice is that we introduce them to every one of them. I have no interest in sending home an expensive device that they're not going to use. You cannot do much with a vest if you're not doing anything with airway clearance. I suppose you could shake a can of paint, but you can't hang clothes on it like you could a treadmill or something like that. But another key one is, which one will they do? Because that's the one that's going to be the most effective. And it's better if they have options. They may not want to take their vest with them to Vegas, but they will take their acapella or their arabica. And then there are medications that can augment effectiveness of airways clearance. Uh, we do use, make great use of those medications in our patients, um, unless they have other reasons not to. And I will stop there and entertain any questions. You want, you want to go to break? All right, so there's some announcements that to make, but thank you all very much.